is done. You can start to talk. Hi, this is Congressman David Valadeo. Thank you for joining our live telephone town hall tonight where I will share information about my work in Washington and answer any questions you may have about the important issues affecting our community. Mm -hmm. If you would like to ask me a question, need assistance, or want to leave a comment at any time, please press zero and a member of my staff will assist you. If you have never attended one of these events before, here's how they work. Tonight, our office is dialing about 30,000 households in our community. Once connected, I have the privilege to speak and interact with constituents tonight using this technology. Throughout this program, if you want to leave a comment, ask questions, or if you need assistance with a federal agency, simply press zero and a member of my staff will be happy to assist you. If you'd like to sign up for one of my e-newsletters, press seven on the keypad. You will temporarily be removed from the town hall where a member of my staff will ask you for your information. Once you are done, you will be then added back into the telephone town hall event. If you like these calls and you want to be included in future events, please let us know. I'm looking forward to talking with you tonight and we'll go over some general information while we wait for people to join our event. As your representative, it is my duty to represent your interest in Congress by introducing bills and resolutions voting on bills and resolutions, offering amendments, and serving on committees. I happen to serve on the House Appropriations Committee, and my subcommittees are the Agriculture Subcommittee, the Interior Subcommittee, and Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Subcommittee. Uh, if you need help with a federal agency, if you're having trouble getting an answer from a federal agency and feel that you need help, my office may be able to assist you with issues such as Social Security, military service, or immigration casework. We can also help you with flags that have been flown over the United States Capitol. You can request those through my office. And if you happen to be visiting Washington, D.C. any time in the future, please feel free to call us. Uh, we can help arrange tours around the U.S. Capitol, the Library of Congress, Bureau of Engraving and Printing, and the Supreme Court. And we can even help with uh, tours of the White House if you call us in advance. But uh, it's something that we enjoy doing here in the office to help uh, some of our constituents when they're spending time here in the, in the Capitol. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, need assistance, or uh, want to leave a comment at any time, please press zero and a member of my staff will assist you. For those of you just joining us, welcome to my telephone town hall. I will be talking to constituents tonight about the important issues affecting our community. If you'd like to ask me a question, or to leave a comment or get assistance from my staff, simply press zero and a member of my staff will assist you. If you are on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, be sure to follow me for up-to-the-date information about my work in Washington and important events in the community. My Twitter uh, handle is twitter.com backslash rep David Valadeo. That's R-E-P-D-A-V-I-D-V-A-L-A-D-A-O. My Facebook uh, page is facebook.com backslash Congressman David Valadeo. And my Instagram is at rep David Valadeo, one word. And then my website, where you can find all that information, is on is www.valadeo.house.gov. And now my communications director, Anna, here in my DC office, will be moderating the event tonight.
Good evening, everyone. It's really important that Congressman Valadeo is able to answer as many questions from constituents as possible. So before we begin tonight, let's go over some basic protocols to make sure we can hear from as many people as possible. Once again, if you'd like to ask Congressman Valadeo a question, please press zero on your keypad now. This can be anything. You have, you know, a question about how our office can help you, you know, obtain your Social Security or how you can, you know, apply for a visa or passport. Um, all the way to, you know, questions about what is going on in the House of Representatives on water or, you know, the drought in California. Um, so once again, if you do have a question for Congressman Valadeo, press zero on your keypad now. Once again, if you guys have questions, now is the time to press zero on your keypad to ask Congressman Valadeo a question. If you have a question about high-speed rail, water, immigration, you know, what we're doing to bring jobs back to the Central Valley, press zero on your keypad now. Nobody said anything. First on the line, we have Roxanne. Roxanne, yeah. do you have to the congressman? Do you want me to repeat what I asked before, or do you want me to ask, say one more thing? So just repeat your question one more time. All right. Why do we not have oil refineries. When Exxon, two years ago, had asked for an oil refinery, they won't put any more in. Why not? When we have all of the oil and gas right here in the USA without even going to Alaska or our other state and running all the way across Canada. Why do we not have any more built? It takes 10 years to build them and nobody in Congress and that seems to want to pass it. Why? Well, Roxanne, I appreciate the question. And uh, one of the issues that we face uh, here is obviously there's a lot of policy against uh, refineries. Uh, but the truth is we still do have some refineries. And I know you're from Lemoore, and we used to have the, uh, the plant right there in Hanford right off of 198 and 11 that's pretty much gone today. Uh, but down in Kern County, we currently have two refineries if, uh, that I know of for sure. Uh, and I know that up in uh, the Bay Area, we actually have quite a few as well. Um, we still have them. They're struggling to stay in business. Uh, we've got some uh, real issues with, uh, with some of the policies that are in place now and how they affect. And I agree. If any place in the world is going to make fuel, our standards are always going to be the highest, and I think we can do the best job. And we should allow uh, our U.S. companies to do it here instead of buying fuel uh, from other uh, countries. But we do quite a bit of refining, st uh, refining still in the U.S. California is just one of the toughest places to do it. Uh, and it's something that we constantly battle uh, with EPA and other uh, agencies, uh, really making it difficult because uh, those jobs at those refineries are actually really good jobs. Uh, I remember growing up, some of my best friend's parents uh, worked there at the Beacon plant in town. And uh, it was really a shame to see it go because we obviously have the highest standards in the world. And, and I think that we should be pretty proud of what we've got and protect those. But it is something that we're facing and we are working on, uh, but it's just going to be a really tough lift with the type of policy we have in place. So I hope that answers your question, Roxanne. I uh, appreciate you taking some time out for us today, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to fix this for our future generations so that we have the ability to have uh, clean American fuel for our families in the future. Thank you.
Once again, you guys, if you have a question for Congressman Valadeo, please press zero on your keypad now. You'll be temporary remo temporarily removed from our telephone town hall, and you will talk to a member of our staff to ask your question. And then we'll add you right back in. So it just takes a couple minutes, and you can ask the Congressman anything on your mind. Our next caller is from um, Hanford. His name is Edward. Hi, Edward. Hello? Hi, Mr. Valadeo. Please call me David. My Yes, uh, I'm calling from Hanford, California, and I was calling in regards to the high-speed rail in uh, coming through the valley, uh, which uh, is going to, I guess, uh, San Francisco and L.A. How is that going to affect the valley people? Well, um, high-speed rail was passed Prop One uh, was passed by the voters uh, via Prop One A in 2008. Uh, I have never uh, been a supporter of this high-speed rail project. And with my time in the state legislature and, and my time in Congress now, I've done everything in my power to, to stop that thing. Um, as far as high-speed rail in general, the dream of it somewhere in the U.S., if it makes sense, I don't have a problem with that. But this specific project, the way it's going to affect us, uh, especially because you live in Hanford, uh, Corcoran, right uh, south of you a few miles, has a train station. Amtrak has a station in Hanford. We've also got one in Wasco. So how it affects us in California's 21st Congressional District is, those three stations with Amtrak are going to struggle to stay afloat because high-speed rail will be literally a mile or two away with their own track um, flying by with no plans for a stop in Corcoran, no plans for a stop in Wasco. And if Hanford could come up with the money to build their own station, they might be able to get one in uh, Hanford. Uh, as far as where are the benefits, well, today they've got about a $70 billion project and they really only have about six to seven billion dollars to spend. Uh, the governor, uh, the budget passed out of the uh, state legislature added another 250 million, uh, but in dollars for the high-speed rail, 250 million really doesn't do a whole lot. Uh, they lean on the federal government for funding to finish, finish the project, but the money that they need is larger than the amount of money that the uh, that federal government has allocated for high-speed rail in the whole U.S., much less for one project in the Central Valley. So what we see happening today is we'll probably get a dirt mound uh, right through a lot of farms and businesses in the Central Valley, maybe uh, some tracks, and then they might move Amtrak over to it uh, as uh, Plan B, and then the communities like Hanford, like Corcoran, like Wasco uh, will suffer because uh, there are people that use Amtrak to go up to Fresno or from Fresno down to Hanford, or a lot of people in Corcoran that use uh, the Amtrak to go up to Hanford or Fresno uh, for doctor's appointments and different things like that, especially those who don't have cars. And uh, it's one of those things that when we see all the different places where we can be spending taxpayer money, uh, something like water infrastructure would be uh, number one, uh, making sure that we're able to house our inmates and not release them uh, into our streets would be a, a great place, making sure that uh, education is properly funded and uh, especially in our universities and stuff where it's been really expensive uh, for our youth to go to college. So there's a lot of other places where I would think it's more important uh, to spend those resources. And overall for the 21st, uh, it, the benefit today is, is not something I see uh, as something I should be supportive of. So uh, there's not much there. Let's hope we can, we can stop this thing before it gets out of hand. So I appreciate the call and I hope that answered your question. Once again, if you have a question for Congressman Valadeo, please press zero on your keypad now. Uh, I've been getting a lot of uh, requests for updates on uh, especially what's going on with, uh, I don't know if, how many of you followed last week, but uh, Representative Eric Cantor out of Virginia 7. Uh, lost his re-election, and so he is going to be a member of Congress until the next Congress is sworn in. So he did not lose uh, his election where he loses his seat today, but uh, in the 114th Congress next January, he will not be a member of Congress any longer. So currently, he is our majority leader, and he is uh, committed to resigning on July 31st. But tomorrow, uh, at 2 o'clock Washington, D.C. time, so about 11 o'clock California time, uh, the Republican Party, uh, the Republican Conference, the members of Congress, will get together, just the 
House of Representatives, and we'll have a vote for our next majority leader. And uh, right now, the two people running for that spot are Kevin McCarthy of Bakersfield and Raul Labrador of Idaho. If Kevin McCarthy wins that race tomorrow, that'll open up his position, and today he is currently the whip for the majority party. The whip is basically the person that whips up the vote uh, when there's uh, a bill coming up on the floor. If he wins the majority leader, the whip seat opens up, and there are three uh, members of Congress running for that spot. There's a Marlon Stutzman from Indiana, uh, Steve Scalise from Louisiana, and um, uh, Peter Roscom from Illinois. And those are the three running for that spot. Uh, that happens tomorrow about 11 a.m. California time. It'll happen back here in Washington. And the way it happens is it's a secret ballot. Unlike the speaker's race where it's on the floor in front of everybody, when you go for leadership within your own party, uh, it's a secret ballot. So they'll offer up, hand you a note card, and you write in the name of the person you want. And then if, uh, if there's more than two running, uh, you need to get, uh, they'll go for a second ballot, and the one that gets the majority on the second ballot or third ballot or whatever it needs to be uh, until they finally come up with a person to fill that spot. And the way I understand it, that person will take over um, once uh, Eric Cantor steps down, so it'll be sometime in August. And then as far as what we're doing back here, the most important issue, and we're getting a lot of questions on this, is water. Water is number one. And as many of you know, if you've been on these community uh, or these uh, teletown halls in the past or followed my, uh, any of my Facebook or, or social media stuff, you'll know that uh, we passed HR 3964 off the House floor uh, back in February, February 5th. We actually passed it with some bipartisan support, so Republicans and Democrats both voted for it, and then we sent it over to the Senate. The Senate chose not to take up my bill. And Senator Feinstein and Boxer chose to introduce their own bill and actually pass that bill off the Senate floor. The way they passed it was unanimous consent, uh, so they were able to get support uh, without having to actually bring it up for a vote. And so the bill passed on a voice vote, basically. And uh, now what we're doing is uh, the two uh, houses are negotiating uh, to figure out where the agreement is. Because we believe the Senate version is not strong enough for us in the Valley because water is so uh, so scarce right now and we feel like the legislation that they introduced isn't strong enough and the Senate feels that my legislation is too strong. So what happens from this point is we negotiate, we come up with a compromise and uh, we get that passed out of both houses and send it to the President's desk. Uh, because of the parties are in control of different houses and the White House, we need to make sure that we get something past the Senate uh, with Democrat Senate support because we need a Democrat president, President Obama, to sign it for it to be uh, to fix our problems. And so we are ha in communication. Our offices are talking quite a bit, and members are talking quite a bit. Uh, but there's a lot in this water uh, fight. It's much more complicated than most people can imagine. And uh, but there is a lot of agreement, and we just have to find uh, the best opportunity for us in the Valley uh, so that we can get something passed as soon as possible. Um, Myself being a farmer, um, obviously I, I know firsthand the water situation, and we've had to, uh, we've had some pretty desperate uh, times in the last few weeks, especially with these 100 degree days. And uh, I, I have cows, and they drink a lot of water, and it gets this hot. And so yes, we get really nervous with our wells, and when wells start to pump a lot less water, uh, it's a pretty scary moment for us. So it's something that I take very personally. It's something that we work very hard on, and I know how important it is to so many of you because a lot of us in the valley rely on our own wells at our own houses, or even the cities that we live in rely on wells. Only a few of our communities actually get water from surface uh, sources like Kettleman, uh, like Kalinga, uh, like Avenal. But for the most part, uh, most of us get our water from underground sources, uh, Hanford, Lemoore, Corcoran, uh, and most houses out in the country are all well water. And so this is a very desperate time for us, and it's something I take very seriously. And, and I do believe Senator Feinstein is negotiating in faith, and we're going to continue to negotiate and find that opportunity and, and hopefully get something to the President's desk as soon as possible. And then what we're doing now, uh, appropriations, uh, we passed Department of, or we're working on Department of Defense uh, appropriations today on the floor. And for those of you who don't know what appropriations is, the Budget Committee sets the budget for the federal government. And the committee is chaired by Paul Ryan, and that's the one that gets a lot of press and a lot of you probably hear about in the news. But uh, after they 
set the skeleton, basically, of a budget, the appropriations comes in and funds all the different programs. And that's where my committee comes in. And so today we had the full committee markup, and we, uh, we passed out of uh, full committee the energy and water uh, bill. And today we are negotiating on the House floor the Department of Defense bill. And Department of Defense obviously is important to us in the district because we have a little more Naval Air Station, and uh, we want to make sure that our guys fighting for us have the best tools available. And then uh, the committee I sit on, military construction, uh, is also another one that's important to us in the Valley, but uh, defense is the one that we're talking about today on the House floor. So if you happen to watch C-SPAN, the debate that's going on is about that specific bill. Um, just another reminder, everyone, please press zero on your keypad now to ask the congressman any question you may have. Also, uh, about once a month, the congressman sends out an email newsletter. If you would like to receive that, and it only comes out about once a month, you can press seven on your keypad now. Our next question is from Bruce in Hanford. Hi, Bruce. Hello. Hey, Bruce. This is David. How are you? How are you doing? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I lived here 60 years, and I've just seen this this water situation. It seems like our governor doesn't much care about it, and really you don't hear much about it, and it's really getting very bad. The only thing you hear a lot about is this train. This train is ridiculous. It, you know, it doesn't seem like anybody wants to stop it. It just... Uh, Everybody talks about it. I talk to people on the street. They don't want the train. Why don't we just make another vote and turn around, and, and if the people don't want the train, then it's gone, over and done with. Why can't we do this? Well, and you know, obviously we have a difference of opinion uh, with the governor. Uh, the governor is a huge fan of this high-speed rail, and uh, he does talk about water a little when it comes up. Uh, but we've not been able to get the same attention his father gave us uh, when it comes to water. As obviously, his father was a huge advocate for water and was part of the process to getting a lot of the water infrastructure we have in place today. Uh, I wish he would follow in his father's footsteps and continue that same fight because the state population has doubled since his father's time, and the need is much, much stronger today. Uh, but even if we didn't spend any money on anything, high-speed rail or water, if we would just fix policy, that we have in Washington, D.C. with the Endangered Species Act uh, and different legislation has given a lot of water uh, away in protection of fish. Um, we would actually not be in as bad a situation as we are today. This year, one of the driest on record, um, even in comparison to some of our driest years, we're getting much less water than they did on years that, weren't, that were worse than ours in the past. And it's really a, an issue of policy. Um, it doesn't mean that infrastructure isn't important. I fully support building more reservoirs. I fully support making sure that we have enough storage for future generations. But we could literally fix today's problems with just straightening up some of our uh, regulations and allowing uh, our water to be stored uh, for times like now. And, uh, and it's really frustrating because the governor hasn't been as supportive as he should be. And uh, those, uh, especially in the Bay Area, who rely on a reservoir, for those of you who don't know, Hetch Hetchy Reservoir supplies the water to San Francisco. Hetch Hetchy does not have to live by the same regulations as we do. Uh, Endangered Species Act hasn't come in and affected them, and they actually have a nice pipeline that delivers water from Hetch Hetchy right into San Francisco. It was built in the 30s, it's got all the water they need, and it actually pro provides a lot of the electricity. And um, it, it's really sad because we're out here suffering and they're living on the same type of water we are, uh, but they want us to live by a different set of rules. And that's something that we are spending some time on to make sure they understand the position we're in. And there's actually a group today who are challenging uh, and going after Hetch Hetchy uh, and making sure that they're under the same rules we are and they're starting to, to go after them on some Endangered Species Act as well. And hopefully a taste of their own medicine will help us. So uh, throughout these calls, I like to do survey questions because uh, I know we can't get to everybody here. But I do want to ask you a survey question, and it's something you just have to press one number to respond to. But uh, uh, the first question is, which of the following issues will positively affect the economy of the Valley the most? And you've got three options. Number one is stopping the high-speed rail. Number two, improving water infrastructure. And number three, increasing domestic energy production. 
So which one of those three would help the valley the most? Stopping the high-speed rail is number one. Number two, improving water infrastructure. Or number three, increasing domestic energy production. So press on your keypad uh, one of those three digits uh, for your vote. And after you're done voting, if you'd like to ask Congressman Valadeo a question, you can press zero on your keypad. You can ask him, you know, a question about any issue that's affecting you, your family, your business, um, your community. So once again, press zero on your keypad. Our next call is from Jeff. Hi, Lamore. Jeff. Lamore? Yes. I was wondering uh, how the 35 is going along coming back to Lamore. So uh, there's a, a long process to making sure that uh, when the, the decision is made where to station the F-35 that it's the most efficient. Uh, Lamore is the best suited uh, location-wise, but also facility-wise. It has uh, a lot of infrastructure already in place to allow the F-35 to basically come in and uh, require minimal investment to make to accommodate it. Uh, currently, Lamore Naval Air Station houses about 50% of our nation's airstrike power, or naval airstrike power. F-35 pushes up to about 60%. So Lamore is a very important base to the whole nation. And uh, the process where it's at now, they had an environmental uh, study that they looked at the environment and the, uh, the fiscal needs of Lamore and other stations that were competing for the F-35, and uh, Lamore came out in front, and so we're just waiting, and I think it's at the end of this month we should have a final decision uh, on where it goes. If we do get it here, it'll be a few years before we actually see it, and I think 2016 or 2015 is where it would, when it would start showing up, and uh, they would finish uh, sending, uh, having us up to where we need to be uh, by the end of uh, the decade. Uh, obviously, I've been very supportive of the F-35. I think it would be a great addition to Lamore. It would further strengthen uh, that base and keep it here because it's such a, a, a big deal for us in the Central Valley. It has a huge impact on our economy, and uh, we're thrilled to have it there. And so I've been doing everything I can to make sure that the F-35s do come our way. And I do believe we will get them, but it's not 100% yet. Uh, but uh, we're working on it, and we'll see if we can get – hopefully we'll get an answer by the end of the month. Uh, but, again – it is a process where they do all their studies on the different bases, what type of fuel storage, what type of hangars, the size of the hangars, how much room, flight patterns, uh, how it affects the environment around. There's a lot of things that go into this because they have to be able to train and, uh, and repair and house uh, and make sure that they've got enough room for the, for the, the guys that run them too. So uh, it's a lot of uh, process that goes in, but so far everything that's come has been pretty favorable to Lemoore, and uh, we're going to continue to work on to make sure it ends up in Lemoore. For those of you who have already asked a question, make sure you stay on the line. We are going to get to as many questions as possible. And for those of you who would like to ask a question, make sure you press zero on your keypad now. Our next question is from Kevin from Hanford. Hey, Kevin. This is David. How are you? Fine, David. How are you this evening in wonderful Washington? Hey, I'm, you know, I, I travel the Valley a lot, and uh, I've been here in this area for about 20 years. And I know it doesn't trump anybody that's been here for 60, but I've never seen the unemployment rate be anything lower than, you know, high, uh, just around the double digits. And I can't see any reason why any industry from the Bay Area would come here and uh, have a shop to uh, hire people that, uh, and from our educational system, that they're uh, weak in math and English and all this. Um, um, what could possibly be done because there really isn't any steady jobs and this EPA stuff is going to uh, force a lot of the dairies to close or move to Nevada and I just can't see anything staying here other than the military and the uh, uh, prisons. What do you think? Well, there's a lot of things that go into making a decision for a business to come to California or even the Central Valley. and. Uh, there are the natural uh, ones like agriculture. Our area is one of the best agriculture regions in the world uh, because we can grow so many different types of crops. I and mean, we literally grow like 400 different crops. And some of those crops are really high dollar today, like pistachios, almonds, uh, walnuts. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunities there. 
uh, aside from just what you see on the side of the road, driving tractor and some of the, the dirtier work, but there's a lot of marketing, a lot of office, a lot of welding, uh, stainless steel welders, uh, even into the engineering, the designing, uh, making sure that, uh, that we're breeding the best technologies out there and we're improving our, our varieties here in the valley. There's a lot of opportunity that comes with agriculture. Agriculture is very dependent on water. And when we talk about water, most people assume that water is just for agriculture. But if you're going to look at bringing another company, and I know a lot of the communities in the valley, Hanford, uh, Lemoore, uh, all these different communities down in Kern County have all worked really hard to attract other businesses because you want to diversify your economy. That's the only way we'll ever have a strong economy. You can't have an economy relying on just one industry. But getting people to come to the valley, they don't want to hear about concerns of having water. If I'm going to bring a, build a factory in Hanford, California, and they're hearing concerns that we're not going to have enough water, they're going to have trouble fi uh, finding people who want to move to California or move to the valley, knowing that they're going to struggle to put a well in, make sure there's enough water for their household or even uh, water their grass. Or electricity. When you look at our 100 to 110 degree days in the summer, people want to be comfortable. They don't want to pay uh, $1,500, $1,500 for an electric bill to keep their families comfortable. They don't want to have to worry if it's a manufacturing plant, which we really want to see as much manufacturing in the valley because located where we're located, we've got access to L.A., we've got access to San Francisco, we've got ports, we've got rail. We've got a lot of different ways where we've got access to markets. But the cost of doing business in the valley, cost of electricity, if you're going to run a welder, if you're going to run a pump, if you're going to run uh, a motor, anything that requires some type of movement of some sort takes energy. And if you keep those energy prices high, which is one of the things that we, we fight against, but it is something that's very important, our energy costs, um, that's something that affects us in attracting jobs to the Valley. A lot of our communities have been really lucky uh, and using every opportunity with tax uh, incentives, uh, with affordable land, even giving land. Uh, I've seen businesses in Southern California give discounted rates on electricity, uh, but what happens is when those things go away, a lot of times the businesses close up shop. Uh, you can get into a lot more uh, details when you talk about regulations from EPA, or uh, the Air Resources Board, or the Water Resources Board, uh, or just uh, cost of, uh, of the employee itself, if it's our workman comp standard, uh, whatever it may be. But those are all things that play a role when trying to attract businesses either to the Central Valley or California in general. Uh, we do everything we can to lower the cost of energy. We do everything we can to lower the cost of living in our area. Uh, but we have to make sure that we have a, an environment that attracts those types of businesses. And right now, we've kind of got the captive audience. Uh, the prisons, because it's affordable land out here, want to uh, house people here, and it's obviously, again, like I said, a good location because you've got quick access to the larger communities not far from us. Uh, and in agriculture, we really don't have a whole lot of places to go. Uh, dairy is one of the ones that could leave, uh, but like myself, I dairy. I grew up in Hanford. My family's from Hanford. My wife's family's from Hanford. No one wants to leave home um, for, for money unless it just gets so bad that they feel like they have no other option. And we've done everything we can to stay in the valley and keep our employees uh, and take care of our families here. Uh, but until we start pushing policies uh, and seeing those policies uh, come to life, uh, that gives affordable energy, make sure we have a steady water supply, make sure that uh, cost of doing business here in the valley is low enough that we can attract those businesses. I want to make the jobs of our city managers much easier when they try to attract businesses to our communities. Uh, that that opportunity is there and we can keep people employed. Uh, but there is a lot of opportunity. We've got, again, great location. We're right between large markets and we've got great access to ports. Uh, we've got great access to rail. Uh, we just have to make sure cost of doing business is low enough and, and we're going to continue to do everything we can to attract those uh, types of policies uh, so that we can get those businesses here in the valley. Uh, we've got a, another question. And uh, this is another one of those poll questions. And so the question is, what do you feel has con uh, con contributed to the water crisis in the Central Valley the most? One, if you believe naturally occurring weather patterns. Two, is environmental regulations such as the Endangered Species Act. Or three, lack of water storage in wet years. So again, what do you feel has contributed to the water crisis in the Central Valley the most? One, naturally occurring weather patterns two, environmental regulations such as the Endangered Species Act, or three, lack of water storage in wet years. 
Once again, if you have a question for Congressman Valadeo, please press zero on your telephone keypad now. Also, if you would like to sign up for his email newsletter, please press seven on your keypad now. Our next question is from Chuck from Hanford. Hey Chuck, it's David, how are you? All right, how are you doing? Could you give us an update on the Keystone Pipeline? Uh, yes. Right now, we're literally just waiting on a presidential approval. Uh, we've passed everything we can out of the House. Um, it would be simple uh, if we could just get the president to approve it. Uh, it's something that, uh, even here today in Washington, some of the local uh, newspapers that keep all the gossip around the Capitol uh, flowing, the headline of one of them was, how bad the trains are for hauling uh, oil and how there's such a risk. And something as simple as the uh, Keystone Pipeline has the ability to create a lot of really good jobs uh, and put in infrastructure in place that'll make it much safer to transport that oil and get it to uh, the southern portion of the country there in the Gulf so that it can be processed. Um, but right now, we're still just waiting on one person to make that decision, and the president has to step up and make that decision. He hasn't gone one way or the other. Uh, we wish that uh, he would. You know, we continue to put pressure on him. He's getting a lot of pressure from both Republicans, um, construction, oil, energy, uh, unions. I mean, everybody's in favor of this. Uh, I don't understand why he hasn't stepped up and just helped us out on this. Uh, but we're going to continue to put pressure and see what we can get done. So I appreciate the call, Chuck. I hope that answers the question. Once again, if you have a question for Congressman Valadeo, please press zero on your keypad now. Hey, Leo, this is David. You there? How are you? Good. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine. Um, I just want to ask you, um, with all due respect, um, have you heard any talk about possibly um, creating some sort of uh, water pipeline into California from some neighboring states? Or yeah. you know, I know it takes energy to, to push it through the, the pipes and all. But no, I mean, we've got it. The, the thing that come, actually comes up quite a bit. Uh, we've had people from, I've had people from Canada talk about it. I've had people from Alaska. I've had people from neighboring states talk about it. And I've even had some neighboring states that were concerned that we would come in and take all their water. So I've heard a lot of that uh, from all different angles. Um, the one thing that makes me uh, the most nervous about it is we have people. Um, we have infrastructure today that we're not allowed to use. Uh, we have reservoirs that we're releasing water. And so it wouldn't cost very much to use the infrastructure we've got today, and it would help us get out of this mess today. Am I interested in looking for opportunities with, uh, with other states or other, even Canada, for water? Yes. Can we do it affordably? Yes. Are there people out there looking for other opportunities as far as desal, desalination? Uh, yes. There are actually farmers in the district who are starting to have that conversation um, and to see what it would take. But at the end of the day, just like the Keystone Pipeline, just like high-speed rail, just like uh, anything that is built of that size, there's going to be a lot of regulation. And unless you get the support of the legislature in California, uh, my time in the legislature, when they wanted to build a, a, a football stadium, it was no problem uh, to exempt them from uh, ESA or or whatever the regulation CEQA, uh, but if it's something like that, I think there would be a tough time getting the uh, policies in place to allow the exemption. But it is something that we are interested in, but just getting us to be able to use the infrastructure we've already got built today is hard enough. Uh, that would be a much bigger lift, but it is something that is talked about and it's thrown around. It's not that crazy of an idea, um, especially when you look at how much water some of our neighboring states have. Uh, I think. I actually saw a plan for some Canadian water that looked really, really viable. Um, it would just have to see, and we'd have to see what kind of support we would get. 
around the around the nation for allowing that to happen. So I appreciate the question. So I'll repeat that uh, last poll question. What has contributed to the water crisis in Valley the most? Press one if you believe weather, weather patterns. Press two if uh, you believe environmental regulations. And press three if it's a lack of storage, uh, water storage in wet years. Our next call is from Thomas. Hi, Thomas. How are you? David, doing pretty good. Keep up the good work. And uh, um, you know, I, I think your, your uh, view of the situation regarding uh, water, power, and uh, food, and the whole high-speed rail thing, those are all dead on target. Um, one of the things that does trouble me a little bit, this whole AB32 carbon credit thing, or this carbon tax, um, you know, that, that whole thing is not really a positive thing because it's taking money from the larger food processors and uh, producers in this state and taking that money and putting it into a pot that the state was supposed to use to lower the costs of energy for uh, smaller rate payers. But instead, uh, the governor recently made a decision, uh, I guess under some negotiation with Feinstein and some other Democrats, to reallocate some of that AB32 money to um, pay for the high-speed rail project. And I, I don't know, that doesn't set well with me because it just seems to be a big blatant con conflict of interest because a certain senator's husband basically has uh, um, a whole bunch of interests in some of the contracting uh, and, and the value being derived from the high-speed rail project. So how's this whole carbon tax money being taken away from ratepayers? raising their energy costs, um, you know, not a wealth transfer to the Feinstein family or well, bailing them out. That AB 32 was passed uh, before I was in uh, the assembly, but we also uh, had an opportunity to overturn it uh, with AB 32 or with Prop 32 um, or 23. I'm sorry, I'm getting my numbers confused. Uh, that thing's actually been pretty frustrating because it's had such a huge impact on businesses here in the Valley. And you look at some of our larger facilities that, that process food and ship it to other or try to compete in other parts of the country, that's been a huge burden on them. The question earlier about refineries, AB32 uh, is actually putting a lot of pressure on those refineries, and the ones I've been talking to do not believe they'll be able to survive if things continue to go the way they are. So you've got this combination of policy that makes it really difficult, but also the penalties. You've got businesses in the Valley that are facing penalties of half a million or a million dollars a year just for being in business, not changing anything, and a new law coming into effect. And that's a huge, huge uh, drag on their business. And obviously, when the business suffers, the employees suffer as well. Uh, one thing that I've always found interesting is in the Valley, you've got a lot of people who want to do better for themselves. They want to start their own business. And you'll notice, and if you've ever looked on the freeway, you'll see a nice trailer being pulled by an older semi, a semi with a different name than what's on the trailer. Uh, you can tell sometimes they're taped on or handwritten on or, or a more affordable sticker, and it's an older truck. And these guys are people that are just trying to improve their own personal situation. They go out, they buy a twenty or $30,000 semi, uh, they start to subhaul for someone until they can afford to buy a nicer truck or maybe a second truck and, and grow their business, but that's how they get started. AB32 has had a huge impact on those guys, and those are the guys on the ground. And that's one of the things that's been most frustrating for me, because you've got these people being penalized, but you've got the true entrepreneur, the true American dream, someone going out and starting their own business being hit the hardest, because they don't have uh, corporate investors, they don't have uh, a huge uh, credit line with the bank, they don't have a, a ton of equity to borrow against. This is everything they've got into this twenty or $30,000 truck, and they can no longer use them because of new regulations. And this is killing the American dream. So what happens from all that? We take this money, and the purpose of this money was to do good. It was supposed to clean the air. It was supposed to uh, help lower costs for the people living here in the valley. But they decided, and that happened actually this past, I think, Saturday or Sunday up in Sacramento, and they passed this legislation to send a chunk of money over to the high-speed rail. And again, back here in Washington, where the majority of the money is going to have to come from to build the high-speed rail. 
doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, Democrats, Republicans, we have so few dollars back here that there's not a lot of people willing to invest in California's high-speed rail because they've done such a horrible job managing their program. Now you've got the added, uh, the added weight of their districts need things too, and they're not going to support legislation to push high-speed rail or push dollars into a, a project like high-speed rail. And then you've got the money that's being taken away from our constituents, money that's taken away, given to government, and now given to the high-speed rail. And it was done in one of those weekend, late-night deals that just shouldn't have happened. Uh, that money should not have gone. Part of Prop 1A was no government subsidies, and it would have its own business plan. It was going to be the $9.95 billion uh, that was approved by the voters. That was the only thing that was supposed to come from California taxpayer. And you've got another third of the money was supposed to come from the federal, and the other third was supposed to come from private investors. And to this day, all we've got from the federal government is $3 billion, maybe four, and we've got the $9.95 billion that was approved, but they need a match. And so the governor is going around the will of the people and spending money uh, on this project. And it's just too bad. I obviously do not support it. I don't think it's a good way to handle it. And I actually believe that if they had just left the high-speed rail on the shelf and continued to talk about it, look for opportunities, it could have actually been a decent project. It could have been a real uh, project that could have made a difference for us in California. It might not have specifically come through the valley. It might have just gone through the edge of the valley, maybe along the existing corridor. Uh, but because of the way that they're managing this, they're losing a lot of credibility in Washington where they're going to need support if they plan on finishing it, and they're going to lose a lot of credibility with the private investors who would look at investing in that. So it's really a shame that they've taken this route, but obviously that's what they've done, and we're going to have to deal with what, uh, do what we can uh, to prevent it from going any further. So I appreciate the call. I hope that answered your question. Our next call is from Nelia from Morales, or sorry, from Avenal. Hello? That's your name incorrectly. Ms. Morales, I, uh, how is your first name pronounced? It is pronounced uh, Nyla. Nyla. Well, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming on. I'm David. Um, my question is, um, being from Avenal and the water and the water storage water shortage, I wondered if there is anything that can be done now. Well, thank, you. thank you for the call, Nyla. The bill that I introduced and passed off the House floor would have helped uh, Avenal. I know that Avenal last year uh, was supposed to get less than 50% of their contracted water, and this year they're in even worse shape. Uh, we're, the legislation that we passed, if we can get it signed into law, would solve that problem. Even Senator Feinstein's bill, which I do not believe is strong enough, would help uh, bring more water to the valley. So both pieces of the legislation that have been introduced and passed out of their respective houses would it help the situation? You can't ignore the fact that we are in a drought. I mean, we, we can't change weather patterns. We can't uh, make it rain. But our issue is we had the opportunity this past uh, winter. There was some rain. There was some. There is still some snowpack. But there was some rain that actually went out to the ocean. And we missed out on an opportunity to pump some of that water and store it for this summer when we need it most. Uh, so what can we do now? Uh, we can do now is try to conserve as much as we can and uh, hope to get some legislation passed, uh, the president to sign a piece of legislation so that we can store some more water and stop wasting it down uh, into the ocean. So I hope that answers your question, but it's not a really pretty situation today. So thank you very much for the call. Our next question is from Connie. Hi, Connie. How are you? Connie? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me, David, now? Yes, ma'am, I can. How are you? Good. Thank you for helping in the Valley. Um, I do have concerns about water, but I also uh, wanted to find out if anything is going to be done this year for immigration. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know if you followed the press, but I've been pretty active on immigration. Um, immigration is one of the toughest issues back here because it's so complicated. Uh, when people uh, don't understand all the different visa categories, they don't understand how long it takes. We've got people trying to come here the legal way uh, who have been waiting uh, 20 years, and there's actually some visa categories up over 50 years uh, a waiting line. Uh, of the people that are here today undocumented, 40% of them actually came here the legal way 
and the system has failed them. Uh, most members here understand that, but it is a tough issue because it gets really complicated and you start to get the extremes of both sides uh, saying a lot of inaccurate information and it's just too bad. Uh, do I believe there's an opportunity to see something done this year? Yes, I do. Uh, is it something I spend some time on? Yes, I do. Uh, we do work with other members who are like-minded and are trying to look for those opportunities to get something done. Most members back here agree that the system is broke, uh, but a lot of them come up with excuses for why they don't think it needs, uh, they don't want to work on it today. And uh, that's obviously very frustrating. Uh, I do believe it has to be done right. I do believe that we have to have a working system. I do believe that we have to have a secure country. I do believe we have to have internal security. I do believe that we have to make sure that uh, American jobs are protected. But I also believe that uh, when we look at people that immigrate to this country, um, when they come here the right way and they have the opportunity to be successful, a lot of times they leave countries uh, who, with, uh, that have different political situations than ours. And when they have the opportunity to be free, to work and save money and provide for their families, uh, we create some of the most successful people uh, in this country because they understand and appreciate the freedoms that we have here. And we want to make sure that we protect that. Uh, but I do believe we have that opportunity this year. Uh, it's just going to be a tough lift because it's such a complicated issue and uh, a lot of people don't spend enough time uh, to understand the details of, of immigration reform. But I'll continue to work on it. I'll continue to work with those who are interested. Um, Eric Cantor uh, was one of the guys who was interested in part of the conversation for a long time. So his loss is going to have an impact on that. Uh, but I do not believe immigration reform is dead. Uh, I think the opportunity is still there. And uh, we obviously want to make sure that we do it, but we do it right. So I uh, appreciate the call, Connie. I hope that answered your question. And thank you again for taking some time out for us today. Our next question Hi. is from Jack. Hey, Jack. Hello. Hi, thank you for taking my call. David, my, my question has to do with the Central Valley. It has a tremendous amount of assets, it, assets with people who can – learn to work people that can there's a tremendous job market and our governor has not seen the opportunities that that this state can provide in creating jobs it can be a world power it can be a part of the united states which which significantly changes the way that we do business in california what can i do or what can the central valley do to support you that will help us understand help us understand that if we create diversified jobs throughout throughout the Central Valley that will make the governor listen to us, that we're not L.A., we're not San Francisco, we're not San Diego, but we can create jobs, diversified jobs, that can be, be a part of uh, the world. And I, have, I just frustrate with it. I'm from a town. Shafter, which we create jobs in Shafter, and those jobs have created things which have allowed us to create such things as an education project, which are helping the education system advance itself. And so my frustration is that if we can create those diversified jobs, how can we advance that? And so, so my question really is, how can I support you? How can I help you? Uh, to get Washington to listen, the high-speed rail will not. The high-speed rail will not create enough jobs to advance uh, the, this state, but diversified jobs will advance the state to support. Well, like I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you were on the phone uh, earlier, but I did get a call somewhat related to this, and I agree. We have a lot of assets. Obviously, agriculture, ag land, uh, is something that has a big impact, and because of the growing world population, and obviously they're not making more land. Um, you, food and making sure that the world can eat uh, is a very big deal, and there's a lot of future in that because you have to eat, and our opportunities there are endless. Uh, today, uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can attract jobs, but to attract jobs, we have to have a stable economy. We have to have a stable legislature, and one thing that you should always point out to your state legislature, because I did spend some time there, and it was truly a bill factory. They passed bills day in and day out. I think in my time that I was there, I voted almost or over 7,000 times. And when you think about the number of bills going through and you think about every uh, New Year's when we hear the news articles about 
400, 500, and sometimes even 800 new laws taking effect. Those all have an impact on those who are thinking about investing here in the Valley, in, the, in California in general. And we need to have a good, stable uh, government that isn't just making changes on a whim, not because uh, what's politically popular that day just to, to pass a new law because of something they saw on the news, but doing things that truly make a difference to protect our, our uh, constituents, protect our nation, but also allow opportunity. Um, I do believe that the presidents have done a really good job of providing a lot of really good jobs for many people. Uh, tons of my friends that I went to high school with and grew up with uh, work in the prison system and they've been able to do a really, uh, they've done really well to take care of their families and stuff. And I think that's important. It's always important for our economy to have good jobs. But to attract other jobs, we're going to have to have reliable water, we're going to have to have affordable energy, and we're going to have to have uh, a reasonable cost of doing business. We have the luxury of affordable natural gas here in California, but our fuels are, are higher than most uh, parts of the country. We also have great access to ports, Oakland, uh, Long Beach, uh, LA, we have rail, we have uh, great access to major communities like LA, San Francisco, Sacramento, uh, so we have a lot of opportunities as far as consumers, but it all is based on uh, cost of doing business. When you look at LA, they have pretty close access to Nevada and Arizona, and you look at uh, San Francisco and Sacramento, they've got quick access into Nevada as well. And so it wouldn't take much for someone to build a business right on the edge of our state and deliver product to us. And that's one of the things we have to be mindful of when legislation is passed. But talk to your elected representatives. Hopefully you have an opportunity to talk to them just like you had an opportunity to talk to me today. And uh, I appreciate the question. I hope I answered it. I know it's a little bit long, but uh, that is something that's very important to us and something I spend a lot of time thinking about different opportunities. But again, it's an informed electorate making sure that they hold their electeds accountable. So I appreciate the call. And uh, thank you very much for spending some time with me today. So we've got upcoming uh, events here uh, in the Valley. So obviously my teletown halls are a way to make it real easy for you to be involved uh, with me calling you at home. But if you want to come out and see me face to face, this Saturday morning, uh, Bakersfield Community Coffee at South High School Library in Bakersfield, uh, this Saturday, 9 to 10 a.m. Uh, if you want to find out more, call my office at 559-582-5526 or call my Bakersfield office at 661-864-7736 uh, or the Selma Community Coffee, Saturday, June 28th, uh, which will be at the Selma Senior Citizen Center uh, in Selma, Saturday, June 28th, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., and that's just an opportunity to come talk to me face-to-face, -face, grab some coffee and donuts, um, but give us a call at the office, and uh, we'll see, uh, let you know more about it. We're going to take one more question, and then I'll, uh, we'll let you go for the evening so that you can enjoy time with your family. Our next question is from Norman from Hanford. Hey, Norman. David. How are you? Okay, there. I appreciate what you're doing there, David. Uh, but I, I am particularly concerned about the fact that uh, I don't see anything on the horizon for water storage infrastructure. Uh, upper, uh, the Upper Kings River, the uh, is is one, one uh, primary uh, uh, area that they could uh, put in a. And an additional dam that would capture some of this water that goes out to the sea. Uh, is there anything in, in Washington that is doing uh, or making any uh, troubles uh, towards this? Well, in Sacramento, there's a lot of talk of a water storage bond. Uh, I think the last I heard, there were seven different proposals. Andy Vidak is actually working on one uh, now uh, with a few other members of the legislature. That would help fund. My bill that we passed again, H.R. 3964, actually has some legislation in there to help build water infrastructure. It helps with Sites Reservoir, Northern California, Shasta, and uh, I think Los Vaqueros. As far as along the east side, uh, my bill helps protect uh, the Friant, uh, Friant system and not waste water like they have been doing under the San Joaquin River settlement. So we repealed that. And that would help without spending any money, actually saving the state money uh, or the nation money. Uh, with that side. As far as new projects along the east side, um, 
there isn't a whole lot of talk. There's a little bit of talk about temperance flag, uh, mm -hmm. but the funding is where we're having a tough time. Uh, but if there's an opportunity to get it done and we have policies in place that allow it to be a successful project, uh, yes, uh, that's an easy one for me to support. But yes, my bill that I passed, 3964, does address water storage, and it also helps make sure that the water storage that we do have along the east side uh, works and it, uh, is successful because water isn't being wasted out into the ocean again like they do with a lot of other reservoirs in the state. So I appreciate the call, Norman. I think I've uh, kept everybody up late long enough, so thank you very much for spending some time with us tonight. And uh, if I did not have time to take your question, please stay on the line to leave a message, and my office will contact you. We do want to make sure that, because I know there's a lot of questions that were not answered, uh, but we will have someone from my office contact you and get your questions uh, answered. So it's really important that you just stay on the line and leave a message for us. And thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us tonight. And it's uh, truly an honor to represent you in Washington, and I look forward uh, to the next time. Thank you very much.